Well, it is a pleasure to be with you. I have never in my life taught somewhere where I'm looking about four stories up at members of the audience. If you guys feel neglected up there, you know, if you get nosebleeds and, and all that, I'm not going to notice because I would have to go to the chiropractor if I tried to give equal eye attention to, to you folks up in the, in the third deck there. But uh, the, uh, our topic is a, is a big one. Our time frame is small. This is one of those things where you wish you could have a heart to heart, but what about this, but what about that? on a thousand different questions that come up. And obviously, in a, in a setting such as we have, we'll be painting with broad orienting strokes. But I hope it's helpful both in communicating a way that as we, as we as Christian people, people who are part of the Church of Jesus Christ, as we think about helping the most troubled, burdened, distressed uh, fellow hum human beings, uh, I trust that we can come to certain understandings that actually clarify our minds, give us vision, and animate us for moving towards people, and some practical ways forward. So, the, uh, let me jump right in with, uh, in a sense, the, the very first question, well, let me jump in with praying for us. Our Father, we thank you that you know every human heart, you search us, you love us. You speak into our lives, you touch us, you arrange the circumstances of our lives. You are God, whether someone's life has cheerful circumstances and they have a sunny disposition and a loving family, and, and whether someone lives in, th in situations that are grievous, heartbreaking, confusing, uh, distraught with anguish. We thank you that you understand and you have put your hand into every part of the spectrum. And I pray that you would help us as men and women who profess your name, that we would, we would serve as the Lord Jesus did, stepping into uh, not just uh, spending three years with the leader types, the people with potential, but continually reaching to the most broken of the earth. Help us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to talk first about our understanding, second about some action. And it does seem to me that the very first question about understanding is, is our faith even relevant when we talk about severe mental distress, psychiatric disorders? Is it, should we get involved? Can we actually help and make a difference? And each of those three questions I would answer with a hearty Yes, our faith is relevant, we should get involved, we can make a difference, and let's jump in. I think the crux of the issue in our, in our contemporary society is that we live, in a, we live in a culture which has completely biologized and physiologized psychiatric disorders. And so if, if what is wrong with you is simply your body gone wrong, then it's really hard to think, it's really hard to get a, get a vision for how is it that we who are ministry of the word people who seek to love and speak truth and edify and encourage, how is that relevant if something is, is exclusively, at the end of the day, biological? The, um, now, you have got to say that some of the things that get labeled psychiatric disorders have a very pronounced biological component. My mother died two years ago of vascular dementia uh, at age 94, it destroyed her mind. It robbed her of the link between her thoughts and her words. She couldn't speak uh, intelligibly. She uh, was prone to many extreme and irrational fears. Uh, strong biology, a, an autopsy could have confirmed it if there had been any need, which there, there wasn't. Did it mean that I could not minister to her? Up until the day she died, she was responsive in an increasingly limited and childlike and constricted way, but she, was con she was remained to the end of her life responsive to, Mom, can I pray for you? Mom, can I read a scripture to you? The scripture I would read would become progressive. You know how we simplify a scripture for a child. It became increasingly simple, reduced to, Jesus is with you. 
you want to sing a hymn? Yes, she wanted to sing a hymn. She couldn't say words anymore, but she tried her best. It, uh, I could continue to minister to her. And there was in her life evidence that whatever her state of cognitive capacity or massive incapacity, the Holy Spirit was still active in her heart and still making her alive. Dementia. Here's another uh, more uh, 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 significant one. End state AIDS, when your mind is being destroyed. A different kind of dementia. I had one of my best, my best friend from middle school died of AIDS back in the 80s. I spent hours with him, late stage, when he would lapse in and out of reality into delusional states, and then you'd, you'd get coming back. We talked about hope, about sin, about Christ, about guilt, about forgiveness, about love, about he, we had a conversation because he's a human being. And the things that have to do with human beings are always relevant. Give another uh, extreme case where the biological component is high. There's a woman named Julie. I, I came to faith working in a psychiatric hospital in my mid-20s, and Julie was one of the people I worked the most with. She had one of the most dread illnesses you could ever have, Huntington's chorea. It, it, it will for sure destroy you into madness. And Julie was in early stages of Huntington's chorea. Her mother had died of it. She knew that before she was 40, she would be completely wrecked. And could we talk? We could talk. We could talk. Though she could have times of extreme irrationality, uh, you know, delusional kinds of things. But she was facing not, not only a biological issue, but she was a highly intelligent woman who at times was very aware of her experience and she knew her diagnosis and she knew her prognosis. So she's dealing with issues of despair and hope and meaning and anger. And we can talk with her, with Julie. It, uh, those are the extremes of biology. And even in simple ways of talking about it, yes, we have something to say to people uh, it, with uh, psychiatric problems, even at the extreme end, the bio, extreme biological end. Many of the psychiatric disorders that get labels are not extremely biological. They may have nothing more than, uh, you know, some children are more born more temperamental, t temperamentally towards anger or towards anxiety or, or uh, towards a strong will, and you, you might get certain ways that they go off the rails that reflect a certain degree of temperament. But you, temperament's not something you'd weigh highly as a factor in seeking to, to interact with someone. But our culture's saying that at the end of the day, it's all biology, and thus the answer is all medical. And I want us to actually come at that question from an unusual direction. I want us to do a thought experiment. Let's say that's true, that all these things, this whole raft of different human uh, chaos, let's say it's all biological at base. Grant them that. Would ministry of Christ, would the ministry of the Word, would the kinds of friendship conversations that we would seek to have with, quote, normal people, would they be relevant? And uh, even if it was biological at essence. Well, let me put the question, let me then come at the question this way. Why would we be, we're not excluded from any other medical problem, are we? Somebody has cancer, they have a severe med medical problem, medicine might be able to do something, they have spiritual issues as well. There's always something you can do. Someone ha is facing major surgery, someone is a ton of pain, someone is aging and, and, and having, uh, starting to have memory lapses and such. Uh, someone's been in a terrible traffic accident, and is extremely disfigured or is just coming back into consciousness. They all have medical issues that medicine may or may not be able to do something that's helpful, uh, but they all have. It's, it's just most self-evident that, of course, we do biblical ministry with people who have medical issues. So even if you grant the premise that is used, you might say, propagandistically against ministry, that there's no reason we would talk to the most troubled human beings, of course we can talk to them because we talk to everybody else that's got a medical issue. Because there's always, if you want to, to visualize it, 
imagine you've got an arrow coming from this side of everything that our body contributes, everything physiological, you know what the textbook would call nature variables. And then on this side, you've got an arrow coming in that's everything that's situational, that you experience, being abused or being loved or, you know, the weather, or everything that is uh, environmental, everything that's nature or nurture. No matter how strong those forces are, there's always a capital, I guess I better write backwards, P-E-R-S-O-N in the middle. We are biological beings. We, live, we, are, we are physically embodied. We are situational beings. We are situationally embedded. And we are a person with an active heart who lives before God. We are also spiritually embattled. We live in a world where there are forces that beyond what we can see that, that hate us, that animate the uh, forces that animate the lies within the culture, that animate the, uh, well, you look at the story of Job, some mysterious connection between dark forces and physical ailment, that, you know, the fog of war, there's not much we can, we can see or define in there, but there are many layers of causality in all of our lives, let alone people with severe problems. And, of course, there are pastoral issues. And... So whether there's a strong biological component or whether someone, and this is not on the table uh, in certain aspects of how people think about this from a propaganda standpoint, but there are clearly problems where the difficulties are more situational. You think about someone who is in, raised in a family that is violent and alcoholic and abusive and cruel and demeaning, and there you're not dealing with something that's necessarily biological, you're dealing with something situational. Do we have minutes? Can we intervene? Well, there are clearly social interventions that are appropriate, like let's get a person into safety, or let's help someone get, a, get education if they're educationally deprived. You're not, you're not denying a place for medical intervention. You're not denying a place for situational interventions. But there is always ministry of the word, targeted, pointed, personalized to human need there. Of course we interact. Of course we have a calling to interact with the most broken of the earth. Look, second uh, uh, second uh, phase of what I want to talk about, I want us to, I want, as, in, as we're seeking to build an understanding that animates us, let's remember the points of contact between Christian faith and the sorts of things that the psychologies and psychiatries are involved with. Involved with. There are fundamental points of contact between what we're interested in and every other approach to human care, counseling, is concerned about, I would identify three, that every approach to trying to care for troubled, troublesome, uh, troublemaking, facing troubles, people, every approach is, is trying to answer three questions that they all have in common. The first one is the question, how do we understand this? How do we explain what we're seeing? It's the question of truth. And the second question that they all are concerned with, including us, how do we care? How do we engage? How do we uh, enter in to the lives of troubled people? It's the question of love. And the third question is can we make a difference? What's efficacious? What, what can actually get in there and, and make something a bit better? It's the question of power, the question of effectiveness. And we are as concerned about that as a psychiatrist is, as any psychotherapist is. The, uh, we have a different take on how we would unpack what's the significant bottom line when it comes to truth, love, and power. But we are both, we are all in the same game. So there's a way where when, when we are excluded or exclude ourselves, we ought to rethink. We're, we are in the business of wrestling out truth, truth, love, and power when it comes to the most severe, disabling, problematic things about people. I do think that as, as we come into this topic as a people, as Christian people who who believe the things we believe, who want to pursue the goals we, we want to pursue. I think we get scared off about tackling really difficult lives. 
And I think we get scared off for two reasons. One reason is the problems are hard and heartbreaking, and there aren't quick fixes. And I think a lot of how we can function as people who we can take the we, we who take the Bible be very seriously can at times think that the way the Bible applies is quick fix, pat answer, you know, here's a word, problem solved, just believe this truth, just practice this discipline, just get accountable in this way, and voila, no more problem. That just doesn't happen to be actually the way that any of our lives work. None of our lives work that way. There's no quick fix. We run the race the whole way. We struggle the whole way. There's always you get through one crisis, one issue, and then there's something else comes up. It, uh, there's always trouble. Man is born for trouble. And there are no quick fixes. And we scare ourselves by, if our habits of thought and ministry are, it's just a cognitive model, you just put out these truths, teach people how to have quiet time, go to church, problem solved. It's hard work. And it's frustrating work often to work with really difficult people. And I think the second way we get scared off is the claims of the culture. So even thought something as simple as, this is basically biological and it needs a medicine, can intimidate us from thinking, well, even if it is biological and if a medicine might make some difference, there are always pastoral needs because there's always a person in the middle of that. You know, when my mother was dying those last few years, I would have loved it if there were some medication that could have done something to retard or intervene on the vascular dementia. We, we were not against something. We certainly would, would not have bought extreme claims that it brings healing. Mom is dying, right? And she will die. And she needs Christ more than anything. But there are these lesser goods. Now, the, the culture is selling me medicine as the supreme good. We don't believe that. But there can be a situation where it's a lesser good, but now let's, okay, it's so it's getting good exercise and don't drink so much caffeine and, and uh, change some of your other, you know, get more sleep. And there's lots of, take a vacation, learn to lighten up the pressure, you're overcommitted. There's lots of things that do some good, but Christ does eternal good. And we don't ever want to get scared off from working with hard things. So people have... However troublesome, however troubled internally, however much they are beset by troubles, we live in a world of trouble. And we have a Savior who said this as his, you might say, his mission statement. And think about this, these words from first the Old Testament and the mouth of Christ, through the lens of, it talks in generalities, so it's not getting specific, but the way that these generalities land when you think about severe problems. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus actually New Testament version, he tweaked it in some ways. The recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. I, you know, I read those things, blind and oppressed and, and poor and captive and brokenhearted, and I think, well, in one sense, that's every one of us, and it sure doesn't exclude people who have big, big, big problems. They're in that category, too, in all sorts of different ways. Jesus' words about his mission apply to the broken of the earth. What should we call such people? What should we call really troubled people? I mean, I, I wrestled even with the, the title that talks about, you know, peop, uh, you know, whether you use words like mental illness or psychiatric disorders or, you know, mental problems or, what do we call such people? Do you call them patients? Do you call them clients? Do you call them mentally ill? You say you are a paranoid schizophrenic or you suffer from clinical depression as though it's a them and a those people and such. And I would say, no. How about we call them John, Sarah, Julie, Guy, Mom, and speak of them as what they are. They are people. And the fact that they're people, 
we, we have every reason to move towards them. A full-on, 100% person. We are all troubled. Some of us are very troubled, right? We are all troublesome to others who love us and want to care for us. Some people, some of us, are very troublesome and drive the people who want to care for you nuts, right? All of us have troubles. We face troubles in our lives. And some people face troubles that are so heartbreaking that you, you can hardly talk about them without weeping. I mean, I, I'm sure that my patient, the, my Julie, is dead. She could not have lived this long. That was, that was 40 years ago. So she died. She had big troubles. But she's a person. She's Julie. And the gospel and the work of God is for such people. Such people also, and this is so important, they have strengths. Julie was highly perceptive relationally. They have graces. Julie, had a, Julie was actually quite a wise counselor with, with some of the other patients in the psychiatric hospital. Common grace, wisdom. She was not a believer. They have insight into themselves. They may be very compassionate. One of the things that's so interesting working in a psychiatric setting is the degree of common grace compassion that you see in people who otherwise their lives are, their problems, the things that earn them a diagnosis are, are ways of being completely self-centered. But then in real life, because they're a person, you see common grace or special grace. In some cases, you see strengths. And everybody has hardships, family troubles, physical troubles, and so forth. And people also have blessings. Some of them had good families and people who, families who really cared. And some of them had money or financial opportunities or intelligence or other kinds of opportunities. And, and all of them, like us, had things in their lives that were bad. Because you work in a, any community, working in a psychiatric community, there were people with temper and who were sneaky and who lied, who were embittered or vengeful and manipulative and bullying and, and uh, lazy and self-righteous and complaining and immoral and certainly lots of unbelief and lots of confusion and lots of false hopes and lots of lies and delusions people believed. Ed Welch has a really nice shorthand for the human condition. There's the good in people. There's the hard, what people face, every one of us. There's the bad, because we're fallen. And there's the blessed, because there's strengths. And then there is the Lord God, who is in all of that, in some configuration, different for every one of us, different for every one of the people we're talking about, who has something to say to us that calls us into life. Here's my third point I want to make, that uh, to, to not be intimidated by the claim to explain that, that there's causal explanations at work. It, uh, and one of the ways I like thinking about this in, in, in taking an understanding of psychiatry is I call it the upstream-downstream issue. Downstream, you hear these claims that we fully understand this problem. This is biological. People used to think it was moral or demons or, or uh, situational, had bad parents. Now we know it's biology. Well, they don't know. We just happen to be in a biological fad era. And in fact, uh, if they actually had, this is, a, this is one of the, uh, we could spend an hour talking about this next point, I'm just a throwaway. If people had a, polite, had a Augustinian understanding of sin, they wouldn't just mock the idea that sin is in every psychiatric disorder. Because an Augustinian view says that sin is just what you are. It's how, you, it's how the operating system works. A Pelagian view says it's just all moral choice. You're just saying he's a bad person. And no paranoid schizophrenic ever sat down in the morning and said, I think I'll be paranoid today. I could be sane. Right? It's not a choice, but it is tied to sin. And I've had some huge breakthroughs with people. John, I'll call, he was John. He was labeled a paranoid schizophrenic. But we connected about the dynamics in his paranoia about pride, 
because the paranoid worldview is completely self-centered. He's the most important person in the universe and terror. He's terrified because the whole world is against him. And pride and terror. We started with the paranoia the, in, in the label, so the categories the label uses, grandiosity and conspiracy, you know, fears of being persecuted. And we just segued it as we got to know each other to pride and fear of man. And I said, John, you know, I, I don't get, I've never been institutionalized, but I can identify pride and fear of man. That's pretty basic stuff. Now, he has it on steroids, you know. He's crazy. He thought he was John, because he was John and he was raised Baptist, he was John the Baptist, and he had a whole wild world. But we connected, and he came to faith. And the, I, don't think he, he, I don't think he'd ever be completely free of temptations, but huge softening of his paranoia that uh, was there. It, uh, he's a person. So don't be intimidated by a claim they're of, of a, uni, of a uni, uh, singular kind of causality because it's complex. There's a, so the, on the street level, downstream, you get these, these simplistic reductionist answers. Upstream, the psychiatric world has a lot of humility. There's much more variation how people think. There's a lot of we don't really understand. Here's a comment from a Yale psychiatrist named Charles Barber. And Barber is arguing eloquently about the idea that neurophysiology and genetics will ever explain what's going on with really troubled people. And uh, he, he says, he talks about the dream of explaining human choices by brain biology that it will always fail. It's never going to explain all that's going on. Barber, he's got a he's very vivid language. He describes an infinitely intricate dialogue between genes and the environment. So he's just picking nature and nurture. An inf just with those two, an infinitely intricate dialogue. A dialectical dance between experience, you know what happens to you, your situation, your family, your, you know, and biology. Each of the partners in that dance is incomprehensibly deep, and in their dialogue and dance, it's incomprehensibility squared to the second power. Um, now, I look at that and I think, you know, Charles Barber is a really smart guy, and I really appreciate the humility to say, guess what, guys? We're never going to figure this out because it's not going to deliver the answers. As a Christian, I add some things because I also know some, three things that he left out. The human heart is deceptive beyond all finding out. He didn't talk about that, but that makes it an infinitely intricate dialectical dance to the third power. Three things you're never going to get to the bottom of, and they're all interacting. And then you put it to the fourth power because there is a devil, a liar, a murderer, a tempter, a deceiver, a killer who you can't quantify. And the Bible never attempts to quantify, you know, is this person's problem 10% their soul and 11% their upbringing and 48% their body and 13% the devil and... I don't know. There's, there's, it's an infinitely intricate dialectical dance to the fourth power. And then you add to the fifth power because all this exists within God's world. And God is inscrutable. How can the clay understand the potter? We do not understand the mind and purposes of God. We do know that the devil is God's devil. He is a creature. He's not an alternative deity. He thinks he's a deity, but he's a creature. That's why he comes in the figure of a snake. That, and it just the way Genesis almost grinds the devil's nose in creatureliness. You know, he was this of all the creatures God made, the snake, you know, it, uh, he's a creature. And cultural variables in life experience is within God's mind, heart, and plan. And our bodies are made by God, judged by God, damned by God. Uh, and our hearts, and you just, every single part of the dialectical dance, infinite, intricate, dialectical dance. That's really important because one of the things it means is that we do not claim, and by the way, we do not have to claim that we have an exhaustive explanation for human woe, misery, and dysfunction. Because the downstream claims that you hear, they are false. And upstream psychiatry knows they're false and is embarrassed by 
the claims made downstream. So what do we promise? We don't promise that we have an exhaustive explanation. That we don't know. Uh, the Bible never tells us. We don't claim that as Christians. It, uh, we don't promise that we can fix all a person's problems, right? The, uh, Jesus Christ did not fix everybody's problems. Everybody who hung with Jesus, who grew, still had a lot of growing to do by the time they died, and everybody they healed still died. That he didn't fix all their problems. He, he, fixed, he created the basis of the new creation in which all tears will be wiped away and all death and darkness and all disability and all dysfunction will be healed. But we're in the not yet. And so you have that dynamic that is there. What do we claim and promise? What we claim is that we have something to offer people, no matter who they are. It, uh, and, I, and I think that, that uh, maybe I'll use marketing language here. The culture, in the way that it comes at psychiatric disorders, it overpromises both explanational comprehensiveness and efficacy, and it always underdelivers. I think it's on us, underpromise. Don't promise you're either going to claim to understand everything or fix everything, but overdeliver. I think if we underpromise, overdeliver, we have all kinds of ways that you realize we have lots to give to the most troubled human beings, the most difficult, troublesome lives. For example, every single thing that gets a diagnosis as a mental illness is a way of life that is extremely lonely. It's every one of those, every categorization is flagging the things in people's lives that alienate them, isolate them. They have this spiral of inwardness. There's a profound self-preoccupation. Again, because they're people, you get good things that contradict that. But the mental illness, the diagnost diagnostic part, it's isolated. It's lonely. We can promise, both from the divine end and the human end, you are not alone. You can be included. You can become part of a we with the living God. He came for you. We can, every form of mental illness, everything that earns a diagnosis inhabits a merciless universe that's all about me. We can promise mercy and true forgiveness. Every form of mental illness has a kind of hopelessness just wired into it. It's, these are not happy lives. These are, you don't, get a, you don't get a diagnosis because you're full of love and joy and peace and patience and wisdom and you're flourishing as a human being and you care about other people. You, you get a diagnosis because your life is not working. It's collapsing. And we can promise hope rather than hopelessness. Every form feels vulnerable and threatened. That was one of the things just so touching in working in a psychiatric hospital for, for four years, inpatient. These are people, and your heart breaks for them, and they feel lonely and vulnerable and threatened. And is my life going to work? And I can, have, I can remember having conversations with the, the most disturbed individuals imaginable. Uh, There's one man named Stuart. He would just pace the halls and babble, you know, word salad for the way he would talk. It was just chaotic. But there would be times with Stuart where I could connect to him. And he was just a lonely, frightened young man. He was a person. He had very understandable reactions. He came from a family of very high achievers, and he was the black sheep. He was the failure. His father would hardly visit. His father just was disgusted with what his son had become. You know, his brother was a doctor. His sister was a lawyer. Stuart was a failure. And, uh, and, but he was a person. He was vulnerable. He was threatened. He was frightened. He was chaotic. We can offer refuge. Every form is loveless. You know, the fruit, there's no fruit of this. You read all the diagnostic criteria for every single thing in the DSM, and there's no description of love for other people or joy or peace or patience. Or They're all about things that don't work. And we can offer the power of God to help you, give you a new identity and help you to learn to love. And uh, 
that uh, John the Baptist man I mentioned became an active member of the setup team on Sunday mornings in his church. They were in a school, they had it in the gym, setting up chairs, setting up the stuff. In the summer, they mowed lawns. The guys in the church would all hang out. They'd mow lawns, fix the, the, the vegetation, uh, have lunch together. John was included in that. He had help skips, as 90%, 98% of the world does. And he, could, he started to use his gifts. He could be part of something. Did it mean that all his problems went away? No, but we don't claim that all the problems go away. We, we do claim we have something to offer that is not a total fix or a quick fix, but it is a genuine moving in a direction towards life and health and wisdom and goodness there. Well, let me close with this. What are Here again, I wish we had an hour, and we don't, but what are some ways that you can help? What can a church do? This is the task given me. How do churches, how can churches help people with severe mental difficulties? And one of the ways we can help, it's where I've emphasized in the last half hour, if we understand the situation rightly, we have every reason to help. You know, that we're not going to be intimidated. We're not going to think this doesn't belong to us. We're not going to exclude ourselves because it's hard or let others exclude us because they're, they're a downstream over-promise, under-deliver kind of theory. Consider how you can help. First question that I think is useful in this, let's not call it counseling. You call it counseling, you envision a whole series of different things. Why don't we just call it, as churches wrestle with it, how will we wisely love these struggling people? That's a question that can get traction. It's a question that you're not going to answer by thinking, let's just assign them to the you know, the person in charge of care. Because you realize that some of the things that are here, loneliness, well, how can we include people in family life? How can we get, give people who are so isolated plugged in? How can we wisely love people of very complicated, troubled, confused, and confusing lives? Let's, uh, let's get them involved. Here's, a, here's a, a second thing. And you'll notice these are all very modest, under-promise, but over-deliver the significance of steady human kindness. This basic welcome, viewing you as a person, not being scared by your weirdness, uh, basic human kindness, you know. Uh, if someone is in disorder and they're lonely and they're confused and they're anxious and they're desperate and they're, they're uh, uh, they need people. And you can, a church, you can always do something kind that counts. You can have somebody over for dinner, and you can help your children realize that, you know, Sally's a little weird, you know, but we love her, you know. And when she comes over, she helps toss the salad, and you have her help set the table. And now her life, by including her, you're actually giving her usefulness. She's able to use gifts. She's Fulfilling the image of God of, from creation that we're meant to be part of community and we're meant to help. And you're putting practical feet on basic kindness. I think one of the questions that churches have to really wrestle with, I, I know I do, do I really love troubled people? Or would I prefer to be with people who are cognitively competent, who've got a lot of leadership potential, who... Uh, do I love the people who have lost their way, the people who most need help? Does your church, is it, do, you, is, do you have a heart? Do you really love hurting people? Because there is so much pain and grief and heartache in every single one of the, quote, psychiatric disorders. Do we really love stuck people? Do we really love frightened people? Do we really love hopeless people, confused people? One of the, my favorite passages, it's such a, just spins you around about the nature of ministry is, is, is Hebrews 5, that, the, that this faithful high priest is in the image of Jesus. He deals gently with the ignorant and wayward. Ignorant means they don't get it. Wayward means they're wandering, right? And it talks about the identification with weaknesses, which are sure evident, and with sinfulness which is sure evident. It's this dealing gently. 
because you yourself know that your ignorance and waywardness, and you yourself know your weakness, and you yourself know your sinfulness, and therefore there's this mercy that receives mercy. You know, the faithful high priest sacrifices for his own sins, and then the sins of others. It creates this fundamental compassion where the body starts to, body of Christ takes action. Uh, Psalm 68, God places the lonely in families. You know, it's a uh, it's just a given. He's the father of the fatherless. He's the protector of widows. He's the one who cares for those who are lonely and estranged. First Corinthians 12, the less presentable members of the body get an extra measure of honor because they're not necessarily, you know, admonish the unruly and you expect repentance and growth. Encourage the faint-hearted. You expect them that they're going to start to take hold of some hope. Hang on to the weak you actually don't have really high change expectations. Maybe most of the visible sanctification is this corporate sanctification in a body of Christ that just starts to roll up its sleeves and love the people who need loving. But we can have this more individualistic sense that you know, somehow everybody has to be fully cognitively competent in order to be part of our body. And I don't know, my mom would have had to be church disciplined because she lost cognitive competence. She she was still part of the body. You could still love her. You could still minister to her. But we weren't doing, she wasn't growing. So never, she could never have a quiet time anymore. She wasn't exercising gifts. We were just holding on to the weak. That's part of the whole call of ministry. People who are isolated, powerless, and broken down have no built, brought into familial ties. You know, so, so it's not really counseling. It's kindness. And one of the things that is always significant is you can always say something that's true. In the, in the secular world, before I was a Christian, we called it reality testing. And you're saying things that are true. Now, they're not true at the capital T sense that we, we speak of as Christians, but our capital T truth includes the lowercase t. So one of the most effective staff members was someone who could say to people who are really talking nonsense, you're not making any sense. Could you tell me what's really going on with you? He had a loving heart. And that's not a magic answer that's going to break through to someone who's, who's uh, dementing. But it was surprisingly often that the person, because their person, would stop and think, and then you might find out. They just got, they'd been, you know, had fantasies of loving someone, and that person just spurned them, and they built a whole paranoid fantasy about rejection and all this. You can always reality test. You can always say something true amid all the fog of half-truths that people live with. And, uh, and you can always speak of Christ, you, you can, even in the most simple ways. You can always pray for someone. And what you are doing in, when you pray for someone and when you're speaking of faith in Christ, when you're actually living faith in Christ, you are actually embodying the opposite of madness. Because madness always is this vortex in and faith is, goes out, and love goes out, you know. So there's no love and there's no faith in the things that get diagnosed. But you're there as a person of faith and a person of love. You're actually bringing into the situation that we can be pulled out of ourselves. That man, John, that I mentioned, the moment it, that he came to faith was... Uh, uh, we'd, we're talking about Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's why I ta started talking about paranoia, and about pride, grandiosity, and terror, grandiosity and terror. And then we segued into pride and fear of man. You know, this is what cr this man invaded to die for. And I'll, I'll never forget the moment I I gave my little, like, five-minute sermonette, which you don't always do with people, but it seemed like the moment. And he said, could you tell me more? I've never heard that before. I think he was born again in that five minutes, you know, and, and long way to go, but there was something that altered in his world. So you can always pray. You can always point to the mercies of Christ. You can always reality test. You can always say something true. You can always show kindness. You can hear in that, it's, it's, it's these really simple things that you are under-promising, modest stuff, but it over-delivers because those simple things mean the world to a fellow human being. 
Well, our time's up. Lord, these are hard things. I pray for my brothers and sisters as I pray for myself that we would not be afraid of people with great problems, that we would not oversell that we've got some magic answer. We would not offer a pat answer or a quick fix, that we would not be intimidated because the world says we have nothing to say. It's all biology. We'd be able to know, Lord, even if it is biological, there's still a person that we can interact with who's responsive to love, whom the Holy Spirit is completely uninhibited by anything that's tagged mental illness. You are able to get into lives. You're able to start to rewire. You're able to bring mercy. And we want to be ambassadors of mercy in the lives of others. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks. Thank <laughs> you.